Bueno, bienvenidos a todos. A mí me da muchísimo gusto presentaros hoy a Miguel Girard. Él hizo su tesis de doctorado por la Universidad de Barcelona, pero con una fellowship en el Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics en Boston. Y, y bueno, por lo mismo tenemos, tuvimos los mismos coasesores de tesis, Roberto Estalella y Porjo, y por eso pues es mi hermano mayor académico. Entonces, bueno, aprendí muchísimo de él. Y después de la tesis de doctorado, hizo un postdoc en Illinois, ¿no? donde trabajó con el interferómetro BIMA, que luego pasó a ser parte de Karma, y ahora ya no está operativo, pero por si lo veis en la vida. Y ahí, en, con, trabajando con Mina, me comentaste que fue donde inició la línea de investigación, por lo que creo que pues, es muy reconocida internacionalmente, que es eh, pues, los campos magnéticos en regiones de formación estelar, midiendo la emisión polarizada del polo. Entonces, bueno, después ya se hizo, se fue a hacer un postdoc en Barcelona, y ahí ya consiguió la plaza en el Instituto de Ciencias del Espacio que es donde está ahora creando un grupo pues, muy, que va creciendo y se está consolidando bastante bien. Entonces, bueno, pero además trabaja, bueno, colabora con investigadores de aquí, con, con Luis Felipe, con Carlos Carrasco, con Luis Tapata, y, y básicamente, bueno, nos va a contar de esa misma línea de investigación que os digo, y, pero con los resultados del de el interferómetro de última generación, que es ALMA, o sea que nos va a traer noticias frescas. Y bueno, antes de cederle la palabra, comentaros que lo vamos a llevar a comer, como es la tradición de Lidia, los estudiantes que se quieran apuntar están invitados, pero pues tienen que estar muy atentos en el coloquio. Y entonces, bueno, pues estáis eh, todos los estudiantes invitados. Adelante, si quieres. Sí, uh, ¿esto tiene puntero? No, no. ¿Tenéis un puntero? Ah, con el ratón. Sí, sí, ya está, ya está, con el ratón. Sí, sí, que para eso vamos a entrar. Sí, sí, sí. Sí, sí, sí. Entonces, bueno, para ver la práctica en, en inglés uh, y pero las preguntas, puede ser en español o en catalán. ¿Catalán? ¿Catalán? Si queréis catalán, <risa> contestaré en castellano para que los dos veis que contestáis. Eh, Vale, pues uh, bueno, uh, the, the, the talk today is to see, uh, to give you a, a hint of what we can have learned about uh, using ALMA in, 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 in well, leading a polarization, okay? And what you can learn in the, in, in the, in the study of star forming regions, or the local star forming regions in the in the city, okay? So, okay, so that, that, that's, that, that's going to be the outline of the talk. So of course, first I would like to introduce you uh, what we can do with AMA in terms of polarization, because unfortunately uh, AMA still doesn't offer full polarization capabilities in all bands. So we have to know what we can use and we can, what we can do, and what are, uh, specific and especially which are the limitations. In case you have some idea, because we know polarization is, a, is one of the best places to study the uh, magnetic fields in the universe, so you can use that, but then with some limitations. Of And the second thing is to explain you uh, in the millimeter wavelengths and uh, for star forming regions, uh, what does polarization trace? With what, which, which is kind of the physical process we can learn about using polarization. And the, and the third part will be giving you some results with ALMA. Because there is already many papers, so I will just try to do some summary. Okay? So let's go to the first uh, part. Uh, Just uh, uh, in, in a, a millimeter aperture synthesis, what you have usually is you measure uh, uh, cross correlations and in, in, in the millimeter receivers are linearly polarized. So you measure X and Y. And then you cross correlate in the correlator so you can obtain the different stocks parameters. Stocks I is the total intensity. Q and U give you the information of the linear polarization. And V is give you the circular polarization. Okay, so this is what you measure when you observe in full polarization mode with Hama. You, you observe the, X, the different uh, cross correlations of the X and Y, and then you can convert that to the stocks parameters, which are the physical quantities you are going to use to obtain. Uh, so, okay, so let's uh, split linear polarization, Q, stocks Q and U, from the circular polarization because the limitations uh, for Hama are different. So, for the linear polarization capabilities, 
So again, it stocks Q and U. You can use band three to band seven. So that's uh, from about 80 gigahertz all the way to 360 gigahertz. Uh, these are the main receivers. So this is good because this is when you have the atmosphere uh, uh, where you can do observe AMA most of the time, okay? Uh, band one is now has been installed in ALMA, it's going to be offered in the next cycle. For the, for the next cycle, band one goes to 40 gigahertz. Uh, polarization is not going to be a part of the uh, serving mode, but probably in a, uh, two cycles from now. Okay, <laughs> the linear polarization capability with ALMA is very good. You can get uncertainties of 0.1, but within the one third of the primary. And this is because when you go you correct polarization calibration, you correct it at the phase setting. But you can do mosaicing in continuum, and then you can really obtain this accuracy over a larger field of view, okay? which is very good. Okay, For light polarization, you can only do uh, the one third of the primary view. Uh, and you can use main and, and the compact array. OK, so let's skip that. So let's go to the simple polarization capabilities, stock fee. Unfortunately, this has some polarization instrumental issues that has not been solved, not because uh, they can be solved, it's just there is no, no one to work on that, unfortunately, right? because there are other priorities. The circular polarization also is offered in band 3 to band 7, uh, but with a strong limitation. You can only use circular polarization within the one tenth of the primary. That's what, what it has been well constrained, but, but you can only use if you know that your circular uh, polarization uh, uh, source has a, uh, is stronger than 1.8% 1, 1. with respect to the stock scan. And this is a really a strong constraint because this basically kills almost all Zeeman observations. I'm going to explain you what Zeeman observations are. Okay, so if you if you if you do some analysis and you find that out that your Zeeman your line has Zeeman uh, has Zeeman splitting of three uh, percent, and it's not a measure, I'm not going to do it. So be do that. This is correct, <laughs> but still people are using that and getting not result nothing no results. Okay, so. Uh, because we are interested in star forming regions, we know have to know what we uh, can, uh, which kind of traces we can use to observe star forming regions. So basically, it's molecular lines, which are very bright in the millimeter and millimeter domain because the gas usually is very cold, tends to uh, a few tens of kelvins, and then the dust. The dust uh, is also very strong because uh, the temperatures of the cloud, the peak is in the far infrared, but in the submillimeter and millimeter. Uh, domain, which is really genes approximation, it still is very bright and very well. These are single the observations, but this is the usually what you want to do. So typically, uh, the typical uh, polarization uh, tools you use uh, uh, usually is a Zeeman effect uh, and Gorich class effect for, for molecular lines. The Zeeman, uh, when you have a, a rotational line, you have a magnetic field, you're going to have a, a, to, to split the lines into some magnetic levels. Okay? And if you can measure the, uh, the population of the difference in magnetic layers, is where you can do observe polarization. There are two types. If you measure uh, the Zeeman effect, is when you have a very uh, a molecular line, a molecule, a molecule that has a, 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 an unpaired electron on the last la layer of the molecule, so that as a molecule has a strong Zeeman splitting. You can use that to detect the Zeeman effect. That will be circular polarization. And the circular polarization is the only way to measure the magnetic field strength of the cloud. It will be along the line of sight, okay? But there are very few molecules of that. Like here, I just show some examples, CN, uh, uh, SO, or C2H, okay? There are other ones. Uh, but, uh, and there has been attempts in the single dish, and it's really, really hard to detect this kind of effect. So, and so far, as, a, as far as I know, with ALMA, there are no detections. But I think it's just because of the strong limitations of, of, of the capabilities in this composition. And then there is the other effect, the more rich classic effects, is that if there, if, if there is an isotropy of radiation, that you can populate the difference of magnetic levels in equal, and that will rise linear polarization. Okay? So you need a source of anisotropy. Okay, to produce, to detect this, this, this linear polarization. And from that, you can derive the magnetic field uh, uh, on the plane of the sky. Okay, there is an ambiguity because, because of the magnetic levels, the polarization can be parallel or perpendicular to the magnetic field. So you have some extra information to derive properly the magnetic field uh, direction in the plane of the sky. And finally, the most used technique is by observing the dust polarization. Okay. We know 
from the 50s that, that the interstellar dust grains are like with the interstellar magnetic field. Okay? The process is quite complex. I'm not going to enter into that. Okay, but we know that grains, spherical grains, are like with magnetic field. Okay, so in emission, what we're going to see is that the radiation is partially nearly polarized. Okay, and the polarization is going to be perpendicular to the direction of the magnetic or the projected magnetic field in the plane of the sky. So this is an excellent tool to study the, the magnetic field morphology in the plane of the sky. Okay, so we were we were very excited with that when Alma came out, especially because we were entering a new field as Alma has shown. And this field is the study of, of planet forming disks. So our idea, initial idea, okay, we can go to a scale so we can resolve the disk. We can use dust, dust continuum to do linear polarization and study which is the role of the magnetic fields in the formation, evolution of the disk and in the platinum formation. Okay, so we are uh, submitting some proposals because we have previously some, uh, some initial detections of uh, dust polarization in disk which gave us some hints of how the magnetic field uh, behaves, but then we didn't think about something. <laughs> okay, what happens in the disk? The, the, what, in the disk, what happens, you have grain growth, okay? And when the grains start to be as big as uh, the wavelength where you use it, then you have uh, self scattering. And what we have found is self scattering is dominant process at the disk scales, okay? So here is an example of why this happens. These are the opacity uh, absorption coefficients for uh, emission and, and, and for absorption and for scattering. When you have small particles, uh, uh, the, uh, like, uh, for example, uh, one micrometer uh, particles, which will be the typical interstellar medium, the scattering effect is important at wavelengths in the near infrared. Okay? That is why when you go to an infrared, and uh, you see uh, uh, in the polarization of these, you see self scattering of the small particles on the surface of the disk. Okay? But the same happens in the millimeter in the disk. Why? Because there we have quite more. We have particles that have several hundred micrometers size. And these are the ones that are going to be responsible to produce self scattering because the scattering coefficient is larger than the absorption coefficient. Okay? So, but the, in disk, things are much more complex. There are many people working in, in dust grain properties. Carlos is one of them. Okay, and understanding the properties of grains in, in disks. And there has been many mechanisms where they found that you also could produce polarization, not only self scattering, not only uh, grains aligned with the magnetic field, but for example, uh, grains aligned with the radiation from the protostars. Uh, 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 alignment, mechanical alignment, because you have gas and dust drift. Okay, the dust. A move uh, in, a, a, a in a different way than the gas. That could produce collisions and isotropic collisions that will align the, the grains. You have also polarization of reversal self scattering. And even, and we, we, even we have uh, magnetic field uh, alignment of grains uh, with the magnetic field, but if the grains are, are large, then in, in the near regime, then you have that the polarization is, is parallel to the magnetic field. So you have all these processes which make the interpretation of polarization in this case extremely difficult. Okay, where there is an ambiguity. However, now there are many, many observations of dust polarization at these scales. And what we know is there is a mechanism that is the wheel, is the one that you see you see most often. And this is self scattering. We know self scattering is, is, is something that you see in most of the disks. However, the other mechanisms in some disks. You also see there, or you see uh, a magnetic field and the polarization pattern changes with wavelength in a completely different uh, unknown way. So I'm not going to enter into the detail, but that will be just a full talk on that. But this is still a lot of working uh, to do with that. We don't understand, uh, we don't understand, that's the, the answer, uh, the polarization at the disk scales. We know salt scattering is happening. Maybe it's related that the grain growth is not spherical. A, uh, the, I mean, this is the problem telling us about the grain uh, dust properties that we don't know yet enough to understand polarization. But this is, I think, a very exciting field to, to explore in the future. Okay, so let's go now to the star forming process. Uh, a star formation process uh, at, uh, at the scales larger than the disk. That's why what I'm going to present the results from ALMA. Okay, this is the typical from Palau, it's Aina. <laughs> we wrote a chapter. 
in a in a encyclopedia uh, uh, in, in Catalan about uh, about the uh, uh, transformation, and this uh, draw was done by Aina. And here we explain that the, the process of transformation from isolated to Loma star. Well, you I guess you already know, so I'm going to skip that. But we are going to be interested in what happens with the magnetic field in the protostellar phase, because that's the, the phase where the accretion, uh, the main accretion phase uh, toward the disk and toward the star is happening. So we want to understand which is the role of the magnetic field in this process, right? If, if it plays any role, which is something that still don't know. And the same for the high mass, again, this is a sketch by Aina. <clears throat> and for the high mass in the star, for the mass in the star, the problem is if the, uh, the star enters in the main film, in the main sequence, when there is still a lot of gas and dust around. So that makes the dynamics of the evolution of the cloud much more different. And also you can have, because you have much higher masses, densities, you can have also this kind of competitive equation. Okay? So the process is not as well known as the low mass. It's not as simple, we'll say. And of course, the, the importance of the magnetic field is not shown in that uh, sketch by Aina, but we know it's important because we know this, uh, the formation of this is going to be uh, related to whether the magnetic field uh, is important, if not or not, because if it's in important through magnetic breaking, it's going to suppress or at least slow the, the growth of the disk. And in addition, we know that the alphas that have been expelled uh, and that are highly collimated, uh, which has, has studied that for many, many years, the only way to produce these alphas is, is through magnetic fields. Okay? So they have to have some uh, relevance. In addition, we know magnetic field can also suppress uh, uh, fragmentation, which may help to form massive stars. Okay. So, okay, so let's, let's talk about uh, magnetic fields. I'm going to talk about first before doing showing some uh, specific examples, okay, because some of them are very interesting, just to do some general uh, work we have found. Okay. One of them is the question I already been, uh, some people has already asked me for many, many years, uh, is are the dust planes well aligned when you go to the core scales? And many people was talked about the, 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 the positive answer. Okay, so now we have a statistic with Alma to start to try to answer these questions. Uh, because we know, and the, the, the problem is the grains, if they become, they become too large, that they will be more difficult to be to get aligned with the, the grains. Okay, because collisions may dominate and they may behave more randomly with the magnetic. <clears throat> so this question was already in the uh, for many decades without a clear answer to that. So what we did with uh, uh, Vicente Lavoyer, uh, Anel Moré, and Charles Hall is uh, we took all the archival data at that time that was available uh, in AMA, in dust polarization for low mass star forming cores. We collected all of them at the core scales. This is an example. You have OMC3, MM6, PLA, 16 to 93, either 16 to 93, if you have over here, many, many of them. And because the ALMA is so sensitive, we have a lot of independent detections of polarization and uh, core scales. So this is the stocks I, I think this is the stocks, this is the polarization intensity, and this is the polarization fraction. So you have a lot of uh, data to use that statistically. Okay. And what we use is, okay, we learn from Planck the properties of the dust grains uh, from the polarization at a large scale, so now let's use the same techniques they use for Planck to ALMA data, of course, which are more limited sample. What are but the, the yeah. scales in those images? These are uh, envelope scales, so uh, two or three hundred EUs all the way to three, four thousand EUs. These are sources in most, most of them in Perseus, in, in, in Ofiuco, uh, maybe one in Orion, so yeah. So my isolated core might be three, three, five. Okay, so okay, so uh, before showing the, the results from AMA, let's show what Planck teach us about dust grains. So the, uh, what we did is calculate the dispersion of the polarization angles on the local. So we have uh, we have one value, some position, we calculate the dispersion with a some uh, certain radius around this value, and also the polarization fraction of this at uh, this position. And we do the statistics, which this is what the technique that uh, Planck did. And then for the plant data, we have here polarization fraction as a function of the uh, dispersion. Okay, where you see that for data for region that are, has a high dispersion, you have low polarization fraction. Okay, this anti-correlation. So region with high polarization fraction, usually the dispersion is small. Okay, but plant was a, a total power telescope. 
okay, measure of the flow, total flux, where in the interferometer you filter out that, okay, the, 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 the short uh, scales. So what we did was say how Planck is going to see the data if we observe it with ALMA, okay? So filtering the scales. And that will be the bias result with ALMA because you are filtering the short scales, okay? So what happens, you still see the same behavior and the correlation. So polarization fractions are high, usually are have low dispersions, but the, the, the power law, the behavior becomes more, uh, uh, more flattened than the, than the original data. So that's something we have to take into account if we want to uh, use AMA to study the, the polarization properties uh, for our, 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 our sample, okay? Because this bias, so our large values of precision fractions for data with high dispersion is, is due to the filtering effect of the interferometer. So now let's go to show you the ALMA data. Okay, so this is the ALMA data using all these objects I show you, but precision fraction as a function of the dispersion using all the regions we have uh, data, uh, all the positions where we have data polarization. Okay, so you can see that the trend is similar to the, to the plaque. Okay, it's quite similar, although the, the slope is slightly different okay? than, than what we uh, produce by filtering the plant data. Okay, so it's in between the total power, the, the real observations of plant with the filter data. Okay, but we'll see kind of the same trend. Okay, so we see that the dust grains properties, the environment is not so different from plant. And the, 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 the most important uh, factor, so this was the first exercise. The second exercise uh, uh, that is more related with the dust grain properties is the is, is the is the uh, parameter that is uh, the dispersions times the polarization fraction. That 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 is related with the uh, dust grain properties and the uh, grain alignment efficiency. Okay, this is the key parameter for the grain alignment efficiency. Okay, so what we did is okay. Let's compute the data as a function of column density. So we have to convert. Total uh, stocks uh, I uh, the, the intensity to uh, column density, of course, doing some assumptions of temperature uh, of, of the dust. And this is the line we found. Okay. So basically, we see that the, 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 this parameter, the dispersion time, the polarization fraction, is quite flat. Uh, so it's quite independent of the uh, column density. So it means that the, the, the grain alignment efficiency doesn't change too much, it becomes quite stable. Okay. Uh, so, so, so the bottom line here is yes, thus grains are aligned even in the uh, highest column densities. Okay, so the gray mineral efficiency becomes still uh, high, which what, was a bit surprising. Why, okay. why did you divide, uh, normalize the column density? Uh, with the, I think with respect to the peak of the column. No, no, yes, but, 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 but why? Uh, I mean, because there are these studies in molecular clouds that at some particular column density. Yes, yeah, but look, here, yeah, yeah, just to make it simple, just to, but in general, the column, the peak column density, this, because this is a low mass, maybe changed by a factor of three or four, but just to have it like, normalized. Like in the range we, we, we are uh, uh, sensitive to ALMA, this is quite high. So the absolute column density, we're talking about 10 to 22, 23, uh, much larger than the, Column density that plant was picking up because also the big was larger. Okay, so the important thing is we don't see a clear turn of decreasing the alignment efficiency. But the most surprising thing is we use the Polaris. Polaris is a predictive transfer tool that takes into account the Rayman alignment efficiency, and you can play with that. So we used the, the model that is, is believed to be the most uh, uh, realistic one on the Rayman alignment efficiency, which is the RATS. Okay, right, is a weird name, but it's uh, relative uh, alignment talks, okay, by, by the group by the Alex Vasarians, and they predict the arrangement uh, efficiency depends on the anisotropic of the radiation, how much anisotropic of radiation you have, that will be more or less aligned, okay? So, use this, so we use MSD simulations from the platinum level group uh, at the core scales, and then we did the proper quantity transfer analysis using the RATS, to see which is the predicted grain uh, uh, efficiency, this parameter, uh, uh, dispersion times precision fraction as a function of, of column density. And these are the blue results. The blue, the clear blue, sorry, just go here. The clear blue, the, uh, the light blue, 
That's without filtering, okay? Uh, no, I'm just saying yes. And the dark blue is by filtering uh, with AMA, just by removing the short scales that the AMA cannot see, okay? And the first thing you can see, I uh, know, sorry. Uh, no, this is the green. For the uh, rats, a model is the green. The green, the, the light green is the rats without filtering, and the dark green is with filtering. And what would you see? This is the most realistic model of brain alignment. What you see is the alma data is a factor of few. Uh, it's showing you that the, 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 the uh, brain alignment efficiency is a factor of two or three higher than the, what is predicted by the theory of France. Okay, so the grains are, my, are better aligned than the, what uh, more the, the theory predicts. And we, what we also then did is, okay, let's assume perfect alignment, uh, and that doesn't depend on the physical co or, or conditions or, or local, so by radiation, okay, which will be these, uh, the blue ones, okay? And the blue ones get closer to our data, but they still cannot break on this to be. I mean, just a bit better, okay? Which was, was surprising. And then for the rats, we will say maybe, uh, because that's dependent on the radiation field, maybe the regions that are brighter, that are more, more luminous, uh, the grains are better aligned than the regions that are low luminosity with the radiation field is much smaller. Okay? And what we see in the models, by using these MHD simulations, the models effectively, when you have brighter sources, the grain alignment efficiency increases, but still cannot reproduce ALMA. Okay? So there is something missing that we don't understand where the grain alignment efficiency at the core scales is very high and the pre present uh, models can reproduce. Maybe that give you some hint that maybe the grain properties Porosity, or the other way to bring with Carlos, which are not better about understand, maybe key to uh, really understand that. I have a very super question. Uh, it has to do the interpretation of the y axis here. Uh, by alignment efficiency, so can I, just by looking at the numbers, can I interpret that 40% of the grains are aligned with the magnetic field? The no, this is a parameter. I don't know how to relate that with a, a specifically grain alignment efficiency. This is a parameter of just your know, multiplication of the, the dispersion with the precision function. It doesn't completely uh, straightforward to the grain alignment efficiency, but this is a parameter that qualitatively gives you the information of the grain. Okay. So I don't know how that uh, converts in, 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 in that sense. Okay. That's something you have to put in the model and check. Okay. okay. So that would be the main, uh, uh, the first results. Grains are well aligned at the correct scale. So we can use uh, 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 the dust polarization to study the magnetic field of the core scale, which is very good, important because many people before AMA were, were doubly, I mean, they were doubly about that, that we were doing the proper uh, work on the magnetic fields when we're using our SME. But now we have the statistics and we show yes, they are tracing the magnetic field, the dust polarization. Okay, so now let's now move in a completely different way. Another result that is very recent, I think is very important. And this is about B335. B335 is a prototypical isolated dense molecular cloth, a cloth core forming a low mass star, probably an isolated star. Okay, it has the typical mass of a low mass star core, like a one solar mass, a, a radius of the core of the other 0.1 parsecs. Okay, it has been studied a lot from the 70s or the 80s, because this is a very well-known uh, isolated core, okay? And one of the main results of this core uh, is first, there is almost no angular momentum, or there is a decrease that people don't understand of the angular momentum. At, the, at large scales with the core, the core seems to be rotating, but you go to the inner block with SMA or with ALMA, and you try to measure the rotation, there is no signpost rotation. You see the kinematics of the lines, there is no rotation. And this is related with the fact when you go to a very high angular resolution, the disk there is extremely small. It's less than 10 AUs. Okay. So the first thing the people thought, okay, a small disk, no angular momentum, maybe magnetic field is playing a role by uh, by producing this magnetic breaking and removing angular momentum at the envelope scales. Okay. So we did what we did is to do uh, dust polarization observations of the core. Okay. And then compare that with some MSD simulations. Where you have the magnetic field, okay, and and we did that. We found that the magnetic field is uh, has this kind of overlap. Here you see this kind of morphology of the magnetic field. Here the vectors are the vectors are 
Ray, no, not Ray. Okay, so this is a difference between uh, people doing simulations or people doing observations. Okay? We never use three. <laughs> and, and of course, here we have to take into account that we are filtering the, the, the core and also the dust polarization. So we see here is extreme uh, our gas magnetic field. Okay, but what we did is compare that with simulations with the Patrick and Abel, and we will reproduce all these constraints, which are the initial conditions of the magnetic field. We, what we found is that initially the, the core was slightly supercritical by a factor of few. And, and this was not an idea uh, simulation. Okay. The other thing uh, that is also interesting that we found uh, in our student, Peggy Cabello, she already graduated, uh, is when you study the uh, lines here, uh, uh, the typical, I mean, this has been a prototypical core because you have this kind of, I don't know, you have time to explain. This is a typical uh, this is a molecular line spectrum where you see this asymmetric with this absorption feature of the center. Okay, so the the blue uh, peak is stronger than the red peak. You can see clearly here. And this is an indication of a, a, of a, a collapse of an optically thick line. Okay, so there has been a lot of work assuming a spherical collapse uh, model to reproduce this spectra, and they have measured from here accretion rates. So this is very relevant. So what we find is the collapse is nothing but, uh, it's not a spherical core. So when we go to higher resolution, what we see is this, that these, these two, in fact, these two peaks, in fact, have two distinctive uh, blocks of gas uh, probably uh, creating toward, it, toward, toward, toward uh, the center. So there is not the, the, the typical picture of, of a spherical collapse is not uh, working on that. It's not, it's not uh, cannot reproduce. So that means the accretion rates that was previously inferred probably are wrong. Okay. But the most interesting thing is we use DCO plus, HCO plus, and CO isotope loads because we know this region has a strong magnetic field, is to try to derive the dimension fraction in order to answer is the magnetic field well coupled with the mass? Because you can have a uniform uh, pattern, maybe, maybe it's not coupled, and then dynamically it's not relevant. Okay? So we try to, to constrain the, the ionization fraction. Here are the values. Okay? And the first thing you see, so uh, blue means low values, red means high values. So what you see is the ionization fraction increases for one per second. Do you expect that? Okay. At envelope scales, the UV radiation and the X radiation cannot penetrate. So the only way to ionize the core is through cosmic rays. And the standard picture is you have external cosmic rays in the galaxy that penetrate the core and ionize at very uh, small values. But that is not going to explain why you see an increase of the ionization fraction toward the center. You should see the opposite. As you go to higher densities, the ionization fraction should decrease. We're seeing the opposite. Okay, so what did, if from here is compute the ionization rate. And again, we, we see an increase of the ionization rate at the center. Okay, so that means uh, there's some internal physical mechanisms that is producing this increase of ionization rate. And it's not external cosmic rays. Uh, could it be that rather than toward the center is more toward one side? I mean, it was like the, the envelope looks as asymmetrical, no? So could yeah, be... yeah, we, we, we did that. Yes, yes. There's asymmetrical, but we see because here, just for simplicity, we have two velocity components. And we did this. The, so one velocity component is coming more toward the east and the other more toward the west. You have, we have more data toward the east. So this is the one I'm showing here. Okay. We have the same, the same uh, mode on the west component. So yes. So we use this. Uh, <clears throat> this is the, the, the standard method. Uh, where you can derive the ionization rate and from here the, the derivation fraction, from here the ionization rate from Paola Caselli, that was already old. And this is the one that uh, we obtain. And the important thing is this increase of the ionization rate toward the center. So this is what we observe. Okay, forget about the um, uh, brown part because we don't have time or resolution to do it. But just look at here. And this is the ionization rate, uh, the ionization rate, and you can see how it increases toward the center. Okay. So that again, as I said before, that means it has to be a local production of cosmic rays uh, uh, that produces this increase of ionization rate on the center. So the, the origin of this is not well known. There are two possibilities. One is there's an outburst of accretion rate that produces, if you have your star is strongly magnetized, that could produce this cosmic rays, or you produce these cosmic rays 
uh, in the chocks. If the chocks are very strong and produce a uh, synchrotron radiation, you can have, if the magnetic field is strong enough, you can have acceleration of the uh, ionized particles to energy levels that are compatible with cosmic rays. So that, that, I, that ionization cannot be due to the protostellar radiation? No, first, the UV radiation, you can discard that because that will be only affecting the outflow cavity. And we are seeing this ionization fraction outside of the outflow cavity. And here, this is the, the expected ionization rate by X-rays, taking into account that the X-ray has to penetrate toward the cloud, so the ionization rate will decrease. And you can see it's, it's off the of magnitude lower. So X-rays cannot produce that. <clears throat> Okay. So it has to be uh, probably low energy cosmic rays produced, probably I don't know, in accretion bars. And here, uh, 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 in, in an independent group, uh, they were, when we were doing these observations, uh, the people were working on the infrared, where they found an flare, uh, uh, infrared flare of the Okay. So there's still some questions about the chemical time scales to produce these ionization uh, signatures with respect to the flare, but this is a correlation of this high increase of, uh, of these high values with the presence of a flare, uh, where the volumetric luminosity increased by a factor of few. Okay. So that means this cosmic rays uh, may be produced from episodic accretion events. Okay. And that is important because it, uh, with these values, the first thing that Patrick Hennel told us is, well, we are doing non-ideal MHD simulations, but in this case, we don't need it. The containerization fraction is so high, it's a clear MHD, ideal MHD simulations, and that will explain why the disk is so small compared with other regions, uh, class zero regions, okay? So now let's move, I don't have much time, I want this to be. So just to show, and now we have to, I think the most important works, and now some work we are working now, uh, with my student and with uh, people uh, yeah, like uh, Patricio Samueza, all the people. So let's first show a, a, a study we're doing in Orion. We are selecting 56 cores in Orion, all of them protostellars from the from the HOPS uh, data. Okay, these are this is Orion, and all the dots and all the pointers where you observe. Okay, 56, and the idea is to try to in a coherent survey. Try to study the properties of the magnetic field at the core scales, means from 200 use all the way to 2000 use. Okay, so we observe this TCC with AMA band seven, so that's around 350 gigahertz, okay, or 800 micrometers. Okay, these are the scales we are proving. Okay, and the idea is to try to, to see if we see kind of a general picture we can agree, which are the typical properties of the magnetic field. Okay, so these are different. Results and you can see that there is, you have a diversity of, of magnetic configurations. You have some cases here, like you have a binary. In the two cases, you have kind of a spirals of the magnetic field, right? Around the source. Then you have some regions where the magnetic field seems to follow the OFO, or the OFO follows the magnetic field. In some regions, you see very compact emission where the magnetic field is apparently toroidal. In some cases, the magnetic field is along the OFO. So you have a diversity of, of observations. And some regions we are cloudy. We, we have some regions also where you see the hourglass, more or less clearly. So there is no, uh, there is no uh, specific morphology than the protostellar field. You have different uh, uh, morphology, and that cannot be explained just by uh, inclination effects. Okay? So we have to better understand this. So the first thing we did, because in the literature, we know when you observe the magnetic field direction, and you compare with the outflow direction, if this is man, a magnetically irregular collapse, you should expect the outflow more or less to be parallel to the magnetic field, the main axis. And there was already in the literature some results previously, but you don't see that. It's kind of a random. So we use the same way that CISO did this analysis for the Bob study data, okay? And we see there is no correlation, okay? Views all the data in your one, okay? But there were talked many times with CISO that there was no proper way to do it. Uh, but of course, at the same way, you have not many independent data, data points. So you have, you have, you want, you use whatever you have. But now we have a much better uh, uh, information. I think it's better to do it in a different way. So the first thing we did is, okay, uh, use some line emission data to uh, C70 you know, to calculate the velocity uh, information, the velocity gradient, okay? And then we split the regions 
depending on their velocity properties. So we found some regions where you have a clear velocity gradient that is perpendicular to the alpha. Okay, and some regions where you see basically no velocity gradient, clear, clear velocity gradient. So the gas seems to be at the same velocity. There could be a, a projection effect. Is this is on? And other regions where you have velocity gradient where you cannot really say it's kind of more random, right? More chaotic. Okay, and we split the, the data in these three types of noises. This is a clear case where there is we see. Uh, the color here, the color escape here, is the velocity gradient. Okay, and here we compare the the the, uh, the black cement is the magnetic field, and the red and blue is the outflow, uh, red shifted and blue shifted outflow. Okay, and here you can see there is no clear correlation. And this is then okay now for this kind of groups where there is no clear velocity gradient, which is the uh, direction of the, the main the main direction of the magnetic field with respect to the outflow. But we don't see a clear trend. You see values almost everywhere. Some of them are perpendicular, some of them parallel, some of them in between. Okay. Okay. So when you have a random velocity gradient, so velocity gradients that in this case, in fact, is almost along the alpha, which is hard to understand. This is more chaotic. We do so the same analysis for this type of sources, compare the, the mean direction of the magnetic field with the alpha direction. And we see no clear correlation. Also, there is a specific uh, trend where the magnetic field is kind of toroidal, but not very clear. Okay. And now, the regions where you have a, a clear velocity gradient that is perpendicular to the alpha. These are two sources. You can see clearly blue shifted in uh, blue shifted here, red shifted, in, and this velocity gradient is perpendicular to the alpha. Okay. And then we do uh, again the same analysis. Compare. The magnetic field or orientation with respect to the alpha direction. And uh, something I didn't say, in this case, we just focus on a radius close to the protestants to avoid like the, the, the magnetic field outside of the uh, protestants has a different morphology and they just make it the, the, the statistics number. Okay. And in this case, that's what we see. When you have a strong velocity gradient that is perpendicular to the normal outflow, you see the magnetic field close to the protestant is toroid. Okay. And uh, we're talking about scales of 1,000 AU or less. Okay? And this is a clear detection. Okay? So this is work in progress. Okay? This is some slide that Paul, my student, did to explain this uh, toroidal uh, behavior because rotation may be so strong that you're basically producing the going from toroidal to toroidal magnetic field. Okay? Now, now let's go to the individual sources. I have, I think, how, how, how much time do I have? Five, ten minutes, five minutes, ten minutes. Yeah, yeah, I don't want just, you know. Okay, so just show a few sources, okay, uh, which I think are relevant. I may just uh, focus only on a couple of them, uh, probably G31 and Orion, because people here know about Orion a lot because Mr. Pata has worked a lot on this very, very interesting source. So let's just skip this one, okay? Let's go first to G31. This is one of these classical examples where the magnetic field is kind of an hourglass. It's very well behaved. You have a velocity gradient perpendicular to the main direction of the magnetic field. And uh, it implies that it's rotating. With SMA, we even have found some evidence that the angular momentum is not being conserved. That could be related with magnetic breaking. Magnetic uh, field is removing angular momentum, allowing the gas to, uh, to keep accreting uh, more efficiently. Okay. So with that, we saw, okay, now it's time to go with ALMA and do it a much better high image, image fidelity image. And this is the data we obtained. You can see the difference before and after, okay? Is this, and here you have like a Blaugrana Barcelona color. Okay. <laughs> Blue and, and red, uh, and because this is showing two different things. The, the, the red is the observations, and the blue is a model that Daniele Gali and Marco Padovani use the typical hourglass from the refractive school models where they add some polar component ad hoc, okay? And then with that model, okay, on the plane of the sky, they, they project it on the plane of the sky, we try to do a very simplistic fit of this hourglass with some polar component, and the three parameters is to see how much polar component you have in your magnetic field. And the, the thing is, and this is the best fit that will be just projected in 3 so you have a clear glass with some perturbation of the polaroidal field due to rotation. Okay. And that can fit very well in most of the regions. Of course, this is forming a cluster. So that is 
this region here, you are forming another protostar and probably massive star and here the hourglass doesn't fit. When you go to the center, the fit is so it's worth probably because first you have fragmentation uh, and you have also a dust opacity effects which may alter the, 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 the fit. But in fact, in, in, in general, the fit is really, really good. We were surprised that was good. And with that, we can infer a magnetic field of the, of the other 10 milligauss and the mass to flux ratio shows that the, uh, the core is slightly only superpedial, which was a bit surprising. We were expecting that for this massive core, which is 20, 30 solar masses, we'll find that highly supercritical is not. And the polydial component is only 10% of the, of the total strength of the magnetic field. It's also surprising because you have a clear velocity value. So it means probably the magnetic field tension is really removing the momentum and avoiding the polydial component to be important. Okay, let's move to that, Orion now. Uh, this is a very interesting source. Uh, this is the early work by Luis Felipe uh, and colleagues where they found these this, uh, radio sources just going in opposite direction with origin at the center. And this implies a, 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 a really uh, a strong explosion, probably like a, a effect of the three body like interaction of, of, of young stars. The energy involved is really large, 10 to the 47, which is very surprising. And more recent work, they found even, even other radio stars that are, are going out. So this, this was a really violent event, very interesting. Now with, with Apata, they found this kind of, uh, with Apata and, yeah, and, and John Bali, these fingers of, of, of gas uh, just going out uh, from, the, from the explosion center at the hundreds of kilometers velocity. And this is part of the consequence of the, of the explosion, right? It's a very interesting now, Luis uh, told me that he, they have uh, more regions where they have found this kind of explosion uh, events, uh, very energetic. So from our group, because we are polarized, have a polarized view, we wanted to see what's going on with the magnetic field. So we did our observations on mosaic. So we did, because this is a large region, so we did a large mosaic. We, in fact, was the first mosaic done with AMA, it was a test. Uh, uh, part and we where we just initially just checked that the mosaic in the polarization pattern was was uh, a good accuracy and this is the Orion region. This ellipse here is where, where there is the putative center of the explosion. Okay, you can see here the emission. The dust continuum emission has already this kind of U shape, probably due to the the gas being expelled. I mean, and, and here we have a lot of uh, gas and mass. Okay, and this is part of the filament of the Orion filament. So when you convert that, you will see the magnetic field from the dust polarization. In the filament, you see the magnetic field here is more or less perpendicular to the filament. You see some kind of uh, bending of the, of the field lines toward the center. So probably the gas is, is moving from the filament toward the center, and just, uh, yeah, like uh, moving the magnetic field toward the center. But you, when you see at the center, the magnetic field is completely different. At the first view, you may think, wow, this is completely chaotic. Okay. But if you see in detail and you forget about the regions where you have uh, the, the, the most densest regions, okay, you just look at the region where the dust polarization is still significant, but the column density is small. What we see is the magnetic field has a radial pattern, a brittle radial pattern. Okay, so uh, and there is a radius where this radial pattern disappears, and then you have like a the detected uh, magnetic field that we see at larger scales. Uh, with AMA, which will be perpendicular to the filament. And this is the radio where you this morphology is changing. Okay, so and, and this radio pattern, more or less, I mean, the, the data here is not as clear as these uh, outflow figures, but more or less points out toward the, the, the region of explosion. So this explosion has also uh, blown up the magnetic field, having this morphology of, of, of radial uh, picture. Okay. And this is like some statistics where within the radius, uh, the, the, the magnetic field is more or less radial. Radial will be completely zero, and the dispersion in the large areas because you have some component coming from, from the core, the hot core, it's very massive, and probably there the, the, the radial pattern is not as, as clear, which is this part here. Okay. So let me finish with that. With we are we, we now we are doing like a 30 uh, star forming cores, uh survey, 30 star for, a high mass star forming cores. Uh, with AMA, high sensitivity, high image fidelity, to understand and correlate the magnetic field morphology with the fragmentation, with the, uh, the, the velocity field, and just wanted to show that for the 
Enrique and Javier group, where this is a clear filament, it's a really nice filament, and it points toward the center. We have like a, the color here is the velocity gradient. So we have kind of two uh, independent uh, filaments that probably converge toward the center. And you see to the here, you see the magnetic field being uh, like a, this, like a perturbation because of the gas moving through the filament, which is why I think when you expect from your simulations. So this is a clear case, especially in this part of here. You see depending on the magnetic field because of the gas accreting toward the center. This is at a very small scale. We are talking about the scales of, of, of 0 0.05. Uh, these are the small filaments called, uh, so, but the, yeah, the behavior is, is, is probably the same. Yeah. And with that, I finished that, I just leave it uh, different mm -hmm. points. And um, we have a recent review paper with an El Mori and Patricia Nivelle on the, uh, on the frontiers in astronomy, if you want to just download it. And here you have all the information of the present status of the you know, of the magnetic fields and stuff on the beings. And with that, I finished the uh, talk. Thank you very much. In this regions where you have a lot of kind of calcium behavior of the magnetic field, is there evidence that you have multiple stars there or something like that? Uh, in the magma project, it usually does the case. When you have several peaks of dust continuum, they are very bright. Of course, you have some envelope or some kind of uh, filament, it could be a patient filament. Usually, they are the magnetic fields by county. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and, and in the box in the Orion, because these are more low mass intermediate, in some cases, when you have like we have several of them that are binaries, it depends on the regions. In some cases, that you see like a, the magnetic field is just local to the two protostars, and there's no interaction. In some regions that are kind of chaotic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have a question regarding the morphology, but uh, if I understand why when it has been calculated this for a polarization engine or the clock that when yeah, you compare the ALMA data, okay, yes. is it possible that the shape of the, the human region could be affecting the, 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 the several magnitudes or well, about the renal alma uh, efficiency? Uh, well, uh, when you have this simulation of renal alignment efficiency, in principle, because these are simulations where you have an alpha cavity, you have a, a not a symmetric uh, density distribution, take into, to, they, they take into account that the radiation field is not going to be the same close to the alpha cavity where you may have a higher uh, 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 grain alignment that at the center where the radiation uh, doesn't penetrate so much. So in principle, even at the, at the large and the small, small scale, they should take into account that. And they see that the, 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 uh, from the models, on the rats models, they see a small decrease. Not, it's not very significant, as you see. And the data we don't see it all. So that's something we don't understand why. I mean, that means that the rats are good, a very good approximation, but not enough to uh, reproduce the solutions. Uh, now that you have. Uh... The samples of low master forming regions and low master forming regions, do you see a, a trend that I think most people would expect that uh, as, as one goes to, toward high master formation, uh, mag mag magnetic fields are less important dynamically? So, well, do, you have, do you have a quantitative assessment of that or, or the opposite? Not, not yet, not yet. No. Okay, so, so for example, uh, how that my question, I will be, I'll give you the question how do you measure that? Uh, I mean, just by, 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 by yeah, but the massive flux is not so, yeah. I mean, the massive flux we usually uh, found is in our case are super critical, but which is suspected, right? Because the, all these forces from the stars, right? I mean, like really. Uh, but if, for example, G31, which is very massive, is forming, mm -hmm. it's like 10 to, 10 to 5 uh, uh, solar luminosities. Uh, you know, yeah, has an hour glass, the, the, the mass fluctuation from by fitting the model from. Uh, near Valley at all, we find a, a fast fluctuation of two, three, where in B335, uh, we find a, a, a mass to flux ratio of eight or ten. It's much lower. So, yeah. I mean, the problem is we don't have enough statistics to just keep a, a response of that because my, my impression is there is a lot of diversity in you know, low mass and high mass. So we, we still don't understand why. Mm. So, we need to still, uh, dive into the data. I mean, this is work in progress. Understand the problem. There were properties. We see here a trend. 
Well, Can you put again your image where you have the filaments and the steel? Yeah. Yeah, this one. The other one, the previous one. Oh. The sad one. Yeah. So um is that is this uh, filament aligned with the large scale filament in, in Ryan? Oh wait, uh the, the, no, the, you mean which one? Well, which one? <laughs> <laughs> so this connects to the large scale filament uh -huh. to MC one, then MC two, MC three. There is like a large filament that goes all the way to. Okay, yeah. so so the question is, would you say that the large scale magnetic field that you see with Planck will just go along the filament on scales on few hundred AUs? But in this case, if you go to here, uh -huh. you see the magnetic field perpendicular. I mean, you go not to plan, but you go to GCMT or you go to a single disk where they trace the magnetic field at the 0.1 to 1 parsecs, you see clearly our last, which is perpendicular to the filament. Yes. Yeah. And here we see that. And, and what we see here is uh, the radial pattern probably due to the exposure. Yeah, but this is the zoom, no? Yes, this is zoom. Yeah, no, but in the other one, in the other one here, you see that, yeah, in that part is kind of. Converting, yeah, yeah. So, so you see the magnetic scales of 200 Yeah, yeah. Here, here is yeah, 10 milliparsecs. Yeah, that uh, scale. Yeah. So, so, so that will be mean that then you have the large scale thing coming in, and only in the few very narrow region of the filament it becomes parallel to the filament. Something like that. Yeah, we don't see exactly parallel, but in here you see clearly the bending towards. Mm -hmm. Because again, this part here, this is maybe due to the explosion. Yeah, because it's right. No, no, I'm, I'm yeah, 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 yeah. But we see, uh, uh, even at a larger scale, you see the bending of the magnetic field uh, outside of the main filament. So this kind of the gas just probably uh, accreting toward the center where you have the all, all the mass of the massive mass. You see that at scales of one mass. Mm -hmm. By the way, you're using green vectors. Right? You mentioned them. <laughs> yeah. In observation. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's true. That's true. <laughs> Yes, yes. But these are the most significant. <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah, well, actually, this is a comment uh, related to Javier's question. In our paper with Alberto, we never found that the field actually becomes parallel to the, to the filament because there's a competition between the dragging of the field by the flow and the tendency for the magnetic field to sort of reconnect or diffuse and, and recover its, its direction perpendicular. So it's like, that's why we talked about a U shape. So it, it's a competition, but it's a dynamical competition. We, we likened it to, to a net in, in the river. And so the net bends, but it doesn't completely become parallel to the flow. So in principle, there's no reason to expect that yeah, it yeah. become mm -hmm. perfectly parallel to, mm -hmm. to the flow. Although, uh, yeah, I, I don't have time to show here. We have some clear, Regions where you have this kind of filamentary structure on the dust and not on emission, and, and the magnetic field is really parallel. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so that's why I say this out of diversity that we still don't understand. It depends on how the filament is, uh, how the magnetic field is outside the filament. And this is perturbed by the explosion. I think. Yeah, in this case, you know, in this case, it's a good case. This is not a good case to be up. But the next is not so yeah, I, I was going to say that if, if the flow in the river is strong enough, it's going to break the net, yeah. which would be the case of the explosion. And if the flow is strong enough, it's, the, it's going to break the magnetic field, and it's just you're going to see. But then it'll be pointing outwards. Uh, well, the magnetic field doesn't care, it's just parallel to it. <laughs> it's hard, yeah. Need some more More questions? So this V shaped structure. Means that the center of the filament is moving faster or something like that. Why does it become or is just too hard to explain? Uh, I don't know. That, that's what I would say from the simulations. Yeah. It's moving faster at the center. Moving. I mean, yeah. to me, I mean, you should see that in the velocity gradients, but it's really hard. When you see the velocity gradients, it's hard to see any trend because the change in velocity is, at this case, is small. But well, the, the problem uh, is at a different scale, uh, Patricia Treviño, 
uh, was showing that in monoceros, is the, the, the large yeah. scale filaments, Sandra, Sandra Patricia, yeah, uh, uh, show that, uh, that the edges of the, of the filament are lower than the same. Mm -hmm. so, that's what we find in our simulations, that, that the gas, as it falls into the filament, it starts flowing along. So in the outskirts, it's almost perpendicular and in the center of the filament is flowing. And, and it's kind of the consequence of the same collapse, no? So yeah. things are going into the filament and then going to the filament. Yeah, it's a, like a multi-stage collapse, first onto the filament and then along the filament. Okay, there are more questions here. I have one very quick question. In V335, yeah. you found that, uh, and in other regions, you find that the, that the velocity gradient is very strong and it is, it's perpendicular to the outflow. In V335, no, in some regions in Orion. Oh, okay, okay. And that the magnetic field is aligned with the velocity gradient. At the scales of few hundred here. Okay, so. Not outside. Outside, you may have uh, different regions, even on our ones. If you want to small scales, you see this. Does this have any implications in the driving mechanism of the outflow? Because does it mean that the magnetic field is not too strong in the outflow direction, or are the outflows less collimated in these cases? Or did you check this? We haven't checked that because we in, in that's true because in this 57 we have the outflow in this case we observe CO as part of the in, in, to be in the spectral step. You have all the maps are, are from part of the same observations. And we see again uh, some diversity, some alphas are really, really highly collimated. And some of us, this kind of uh, open, wide shape where the CO is basically tracing the cavity of the alpha. So that's something we can explore. But apparently, because we didn't, the, the, the selection, the way to uh, yeah, to divide, to classify, was not taking into account the alpha, but only the, whether the alpha is perpendicular or not across the layer, but not yeah. the alpha. Okay. Something to check. Okay, so I don't know if there are questions. No. <laughs> okay, so if not, thank you very much, Jason yeah. again. And students, one more time. Yeah.